Listen up, Gotham. This is Batman. Tune into the Bat Fanatic podcast with Sammy Warmhands. And if you don't, I'll be coming for you. Hey, everybody, it's the Dark Knight of Rap, Sammy Warmhands, and this is the Bat Fanatic podcast. As always, I'll be joined by my co hosts, Ben and Evan. First, I got to shout out our longtime sponsor, Radar Toys, right here in Eugene, Oregon. You can go to RadarToys.com and get free shipping in the U.S. and save an additional 10% at checkout using our code BATFANPOD. You can also support this show by uh, subscribing to our Patreon. It's the link in our Instagram bio at BATFANADDICT or Patreon.com slash BATFANADDICT. And that will go toward our monthly expenses in hosting the show just so we don't have to put any ads in and interrupt the flow. Now, we have done the long Halloween on the show before, but we are going to dive into parts one and two of the new animated remake, The Long Halloween. All right. Batman, The Long Halloween, 2021, the animated adaptation. This was written by Tim Sheridan, directed by Chris Palmer. There's a massive cast, but... In the core cast, in the opening credits, they just credit Jensen Eccles, Josh Demel, and Naya Rivera, RIP. We do have a couple other familiar faces. Troy Baker returns as a Joker. David Dasmalshian from the Suicide Squad that we just talked about and many other things. Uh, Scarecrow does, Polka Dot Man? Yeah, he was Polka Dot Man, but he does a uh, Calendar Man in this. Cool. Music composed by Michael Gatt. Initial thoughts on The Long Halloween. This is one that we read, I believe, last season and reviewed, or maybe the beginning of this year. You know, they've taken a lot of these classic ones and remade them. And honestly, I was very impressed by this. It's kind of surprised me. So I made a joke last time about sitting down to read, and I'm like, oh, it could have been... Like three hours of killing people in video games. And <laughs> that is literally the feeling I had at the beginning of this. I'm like, oh, this better be good because this is three hours long and it's three hours of that I could be doing. And uh. When we reviewed this, it was like, fuck, dude, this is dense. I mean, 12 or 13 issues. I mean, it was quite a bit of content crammed in there. And not to rush to my uh, pros yet, but I mean, one thing that struck me right away, we're seeing this in the first five minutes, is they are moving through this story very expediently. I mean, it is trimming the fat in a way that a lot of adaptations either like, well, where's this fucking main character? Why did you, you know, when you go from the book to the original, uh, but they really keep all the good shit and just kind of um, keep the story moving along. Yeah, it makes the core story stronger because they, yeah. as you say, they trimmed away the fat. So it's you're always kind of focused on what are the main goals? What are the problems? What are they dealing with? I agree with you agreeing with me. <laughs> I started it, so you agreed with me, and then I... Whoa, Tuche. I've watched, like, the Halloween music and a couple other things recently, yeah. and something about this intro music was... Uh, there must have been synths or some spacey yeah, shit. That tense know. and dramatic. It's very, yeah. like, 80s, 90s thriller music. Yeah, the title <laughs> sequence is awesome. I mean, there's a quick cold open of Alberto doing the crossword, and they sort of condense that backstage at the wedding scene into this little Falcone reminding Bruce that, you know, his father was once pretty close with the family and, and Bruce just not not biting on it. But it pretty much immediately goes into this title sequence that's awesome. I, I already love the style just right out of the gate and they're kind of breathing new life into Tim Sale's artwork the way that they, you know, I don't know why, but it always appeals to me when someone can take a photo or a still and give it motion through animation. Yeah, and like, retain what made it special. Yeah. The art in this felt like a mix of the Tim Sale artwork and a lot of year one stuff. Which mm. I like, because some of the Tim Sale stuff is like that, almost like Frank Miller, like proportions are weird at times and exaggerated and odd angles and stuff. Mm -hmm. Whereas year one, everything was fairly consistent and restrained. And so this was like the ideas of the original Long Halloween with the restraint of year one, visually. Yes, I think it has the tone of the long Halloween, and, you know, the kind of palette and the mood of it. But, I mean, really, it doesn't look anything like Tim's character designs, and mm -hmm. it still feels very on-brand. This art, to me, looks like 
graduated classic cartoons to me, mm-hmm. like 1950s, uh, like Johnny Quest, like the Roman is like a large beastly mobster man and he's no longer like a man made of lumps and scars. Do you understand why Sophia is so huge? You can, uh, you could see a line connecting those two characters. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. Now I get that. Now I see this. Well, yeah, <laughs> I didn't. Now they're both like big in the past. I thought that they were big and lumpy. I wasn't really thinking about them being related and the lumps being related but well uh, actually though sophia was kind of repulsive to me in the, in the books definitely i yeah. mean she can't get away from that she has a big jaw and big shoulders but i mean she's designed to be attractive yeah i would wrestle with her <laughs> and <laughs> i'm not even says, a wrestling man moroni at some point says something like oh you beautiful or maybe somebody says that to her and it's like not sarcastic <laughs> <laughs> like, big, beautiful, whatever. Like, yeah, yeah, I believe it. Strong. You were saying this is Johnny Quest, like, uh, yeah, it's whatever recent thing we did had the same vibe of like '70s animation, like the ideas of '70s Western animation. Yeah, the proportions totally. and the style. I think that this looks a lot like Justice Society did. Only in that one, they were leaning even harder into like this is a 1950s cartoon. Yeah. And they kind of gave the whole thing like, like a early movies World War Two. They kind of rode the Wonder Woman sepia tone stuff a little bit. And this one, the palette is more akin to the book, but the character art is like a real deviation. But instead, the Johnny Quest ish stuff with like the solid blacks and the double thick exterior outlines and yeah. the simple line art. The double thick black outlines. Yeah, and I love that. maybe I'm off because you guys are more into animation, but that reminded me of Archer a lot. Yeah, for in, sure. a, in a very Definitely. dark setting, it worked in a different way, but it did kind of have that familiarity to me. Totally, which makes sense too, because that's that whole like C Lab 2021 is pulls from an old C Lab cartoon, which is an old 1950s 60s cartoon. Frisky Dingo plays off that. Archer plays off that. Where oh, okay. it's just kind of like the elevated version of a similar art style. What if you think of the people who made those shows? That's like when they were kids. That would have been the cartoons yeah. they were watching. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, and I also noticed in the closing credits, once again, we have a lot of Asian names in the animation team. And yeah, so- taking our jobs. <laughs> no, so I'm just saying, like, whatever. I agree with you. They're taking our jobs. Whoever they. Good point, Sam. Whoever they outsource <laughs> this to, I think it looks a lot better than a lot of the modern DC animation that we sort of smooth, criticize. Extremely smooth. Yeah, it I, never has that feeling of like, oh, they they save money on this scene for that scene. It was like it's consistent and smooth the entire time. Yeah, when it I still s- doesn't quite have that awesome frame rate of the animated series in the 90s that I love, but I think this it's is the best. Digital. Yeah, it's still the best version of that. When I first saw these trailers, I was like, yeah, especially because we've been exploring like some of the other more recent cartoons. And I'm yeah. like, eh, I don't really, I'm not super digging this. And, and then as soon as I saw these trailers, I, I thought that uh, like, yes, my eyeballs will like this whole thing. Oh, yeah. I, I was intrigued by the trailer, but I also was sort of like guarded. Like, don't get your hopes up, though. It's it's still one of these. You know? That's what I found, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't remember what I said on this podcast, but I really liked The Dark Knight Returns. And that's one oh, of my yeah. favorite books. And Long Halloween, I think, is important and good, but it's not one of my favorite books. So for that same way, I was kind of like, well, it's, it's going to be a faithful adaptation of a thing I sort of like. <laughs> mm-hmm. let's see how, it goes. how much do I care? Yeah. All right. Well, let's get into the story because uh, there is a lot of it. We instantly skip 40 pages of the Johnny VD wedding and begin with his murder. The jack lantern there next to the bathtub, blood, and the murder weapon with the pacifier and everything. I'd have thought in watching this for the first time, maybe I'm forgetting. Maybe in the books it goes blam, blam, blam. And that is visually indicating that multiple shots are fired. And I don't know why, but I always just assumed that it was a single shot. Because if a bottle nipple silenced a gunshot, it would, I think, only work for the very first one. 
Well, they shot with the sound design because the shot gets progressively louder each subsequent shot. Mm. Yeah, and I just checked the book, and there are two shells coming out of the gun. Yeah. I had the exact same thought. It's written in my notes right here. Why would you choose a single-use silencer if you intend to use multiple shots every time? Yeah. The other thing, they talk about how it is a twenty-two caliber pistol. A twenty-two of most any kind makes very little sound anyways. It doesn't seem like a good gun to use to kill people, and it's already very quiet. Well, that's why a pre-used baby bottle silencer is all right. It's not very loud. <laughs> yeah, okay. You're looking at it the wrong way. I, I heard okay. two pops, and I thought that that must not have been a gun. But if I heard three... Holiday was like... Well, I want them to call me the baby bottle nipple killer. So the only way to do this <laughs> yeah, is if I use this every single time. Yeah, yeah. What's a dope villain name that strikes fear into the hearts of citizens? <laughs> One thing that I thought would have been tight is if they did a little tie back to the book, uh, black and white murder scene mm. with, was, with, the, with the splash yeah. of color. I was like, ah, I wish you, I I wish you would have had that. I was that it didn't fade to that. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, something just like, oh man, I wish they would have dropped it, either giving me kind of like a pow, 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 like still shot sequence, like shot, 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 and just a couple stills, or if they would have taken the color out and did the visual nod to the source. Yeah, same thing. Well, I did actually have the book with me i i watched part one the other day and then i was like oh shit maybe the guys want to do that this weekend and so i had already watched part one when you said yes so then i watched part two just to finish that you know <laughs> and then i had to watch both of them again to take the notes so um <laughs> the second time when i'm taking my notes i brought the book with me I would occasionally just kind of pause and be like, now let me refresh my memory here. Like, oh, we cut out all that shit. Oh, we did this scene, but we did it in a different setting. And oh, like, you know, kind of just uh, taking stock of those things. So I, I, I will integrate a little bit of that as we talk about it. Nice. And here we have a, a new scene where it's Halloween at the manor and Bruce chastises Alfred for leaving the gates open during, you know, sort of a crime wave in Gotham and Alfred ghosts him for a change, <laughs> which I like. He's kind of bitching about this whole thing and Alfred's trying to retain some hope and positivity as he does, you know? Like we haven't had kids come here in ten years. Why would anyone come in now? And he's like, Oh, you know, you never know and then he keeps bitching and Alfred just fucking leaves. Mm -hmm. I hate when he does that. Yeah. I like that they reversed it on him. Gordon gets called to this crime scene and has to cancel trick-or-treating with his kids. He was prepping to go out with them. And I want to just highlight Billy Burke's performance as Jim Gordon. I think he was cast very well. Yeah, I'm not familiar with his work, but I found him a, a very good Jim Gordon. He's the dad in Twilight. Gotcha. Isn't he? <gasps> I, so. uh, I never saw okay. it, but I, every time I hear him talk as Gordon, I'm trying to reconcile that. I was like, that's what the dad in Twilight sounds like. <laughs> when that guy's talking to Bella, that's the voice that comes out. Wait, so how are you talking so much about this movie that you've supposedly never seen? I never said I never saw it. You when just said it. Never saw it. You just said it. <laughs> I'm not sure that happened. Did What's his name? Anything? I'm going to rewind it. Uh, I never saw I it. Yeah, you're right, Ben. Billy Burke? Yep. What other famous things has he done? Has he done anything famous? <laughs> Noteworthy? What's this guy's deal? <laughs> Gilmore Girls. Okay, that that would catapult anyone to fame. If you're Many. just tuning in, this is the Billy Burke Podcast. Yeah, let's stop doing this hey, now. He, he had a mustache in Twilight, so that makes him perfect for <laughs> <laughs> There, that's the edit I'll use. Boom. Harvey finds Gilda at home on the back porch. She is smoking and drinking. The lights appear to be off in the house, and a full bowl of candy implies she's been ignoring these kids. He asks if she had any kids, and he words it like that instead of like, it's pretty fucking insane. Did anyone Harvey. come to the door? Did have any children visited and our house? She looks confused and almost a little offended. And I like this on the rewatch because it didn't really mean much to me at the time, but in seeing the way that they reimagine the story, I thought that was that was a cool early way to plant the seed. Um, I think that that's cool anytime that somebody does something that slips in under the radar. Yep. You know, that seems like 
standard talking right there. You're being a butt, Harvey. Come on. Or like she was then, spacing out, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. And then you give it a rewatch and you're like, oh, that was smarter than I thought it was. Yeah. That's the shit that I really like in songwriting. I mean, if like the fun thing about rap is that it's so dense that you can put layers and layers and layers of shit in there that... I mean, I'm still catching stuff on some of my favorite records that I've had for 10, 15 years. It's like, wait, I never heard that one before, you know? And mm-hmm. uh, I've that's that, a creative that's way cool. to call someone gay. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, rap. <laughs> they begin to settle in for a relaxing evening together when he spots the bat signal in the distance and leaves to go meet Gordon on the roof. Now, this scene was originally set in Gordon's office. But since we had skipped their first meeting, Batman, Dent, and Gordon on the roof, they set it there. Not something I noticed the first time because it's such a familiar setting, but I like how they kind of repurposed it. If Batman and Gordon met at any other place other than the roof and his office, where would it be, do you think? Well, they met at a diner in that one episode holiday nights it's like new year's eve and they have a coffee and then it's like oh yeah we do this every year batman goes inside and sits down in a dunkin donuts yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotham <laughs> runs on duncan the body was identified as johnny vd and harvey is incensed because he was state's witness and he was going to turn on uh, falcone and we see the signature murder weapon with the pacifier and batman notices catwoman watching from afar. Now, Falcone blames not Maroney for killing Vidi, but he blames Dent for opening all this shit up, putting a target on his back. And Anthony, the guy at the end of the table, says, like, we got to strike now so we don't look even more weak, right? So you don't look weak. Exactly. And they just take him and throw him, I don't want to say down the stairs, but throw him down the gap between the circular stairs Mm -hmm. all the way to the lobby from this penthouse. Without saying a word. Yeah, I feel like, was that American Psycho or something that that happened in? I want to feel like- American Psycho has Christian Bale where he dangles the chainsaw. Yeah, he drops the chainsaw. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But someone goes like all the way down and then he drops it. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought Uh, of. In the newest Dread movie, they shoot a person with strong drugs in the face and then toss them off into the courtyard of a- uh, Incredibly tall future building. It's a beautiful scene, despite it sounding. <laughs> yeah, and it is a great movie. Yeah, I just rewind that and watch it over and over. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, make sure no one's around. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, I kind of had a thought there because it's all silent of like, you know, the Roman being like, "Whoa, why did you throw him down?" I just wanted you to like remove yeah. him from the room. <laughs> like, he runs a part of the city. I need his administrative skills. You just <laughs> killed him. I didn't That's say our that. bookkeeper, man. You got to work on your signals. Now, speaking of no sound, we get this Bat-Cat roof chase, which is awesome, and we love these beautiful splash pages. But what's cool here is there's no music. It's only Foley sounds. It's rain and footsteps and jumps, and I think that is really cool. I'm also surprised then when Catwoman speaks, because... Naya, the young woman who plays Catwoman, again, I mentioned R.I.P., this was her last role. She sounds to me like a Batgirl voice or Holly or something else. She sounds very young and not as sultry as we're used to hearing from Selena. Mm -hmm. I I liked it. After that first scene, uh, I had no issue, but like when I heard it the very first time, like they show her costume through these jumps and flips, and then they pan up her body to her face. And she opens her mouth, and I was like, oh, this is a, a younger version. Different. Yeah, when you see the like plain clothes version of her, then mm-hmm. I think that the voice matches a little bit better, because yeah. I pictured Long Halloween Catwoman being a little bit older. Yeah. And additionally, like a lot of her dialogue is kind of playful. You know, like, you need some fun in your life, Batman. Yeah. That's why we're messing around and playing these games. So her, her having a more youthful voice makes sense in that way. And you mentioned her, Selena. I like her design, her facial design. I think she's very beautiful in this. Uh, Me too. I kind of wish that they would have tried to do kind of a newer take that was more akin to the source. 
some of the design reminded me of the redesign from the second Batman animated series. Yeah. Which is like a black suit and just a white mouth is showing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For as much as I advocated for Tim Sale when we did these books, I think, if anything, what I like about them more than the character designs is the mood and the tone yeah. that, that is set. Yeah. Some of the faces and hair and stuff is weird. Absolutely. And I like uh -huh. that they kept the vibe but changed everything else. Because to me, these are more classic-looking Batman characters, and I find that an improvement in many ways. I'm kind of in between because I actually am really fond of Tim Sale's Catwoman. Not just Catwoman, but Tim Sale's Selena Kyle. I like that. Uh -huh. Patrick and Joe, like long curly hair, curly hair. 80s, yeah, like fashion design illustration. But I really like this Selena Kyle as well. Yeah. Cuter is a better term for it. So she leads Batman to Falcone's money stash and Dent finds them, meets them there, whatever. And he kind of hints at his first lapse in judgment when he says, you know, if we were any two other men, you know, and Batman's like, we're not. Also, I have a billion dollars. So yeah, yeah. You. Uh, yeah, a little, uh, like, elbow. Like, I'm actually incredibly rich Bruce Wayne. You know, I know you and your wife could use some money, but <laughs> no. I didn't think about that. Like, he has actually no incentive. Yeah, it makes no difference to him. Harvey and Gilda could have just left, lived their lives. Yeah. Catwoman proposes that they <laughs> burn it up. And Batman calls for a coin flip. At first, I was like, why would he leave that up to chance? But then we see it's a very Dark Knight thing, you know, to make my own luck. So Falcone orders a hit. This is implied in sort of a montage while he sees the warehouse burning in the distance from his penthouse window. Harvey gets home. He notices that it's a two-headed coin. And Gilda seems very despondent. She's like out in the backyard again, but like alone on the swing set in the dark and you know he's trying to cheer her up and he scoops her up and walks towards the house and whole thing explodes so far what i'm already liking though is that they are grounding this stuff a little bit you see the issues between them from the beginning which i didn't get mm -hmm. when I read it. yeah thanksgiving there's a car chase into chinatown batman looks really badass when he skids to a stop the roof opens, slides forward like 89 Batmobile, and he hops out. Like, I love that shot with, like, the Dutch angle and just, yeah, super cool. He roughly interrogates, I believe, Mickey Chen, not Mickey Sullivan, for his Great. involvement in the Dent bombing. Punches his open wound repeatedly. Yes. I thought yeah. you didn't hurt people. You thought wrong, you know. In the original, this is where they take a guy in for questioning, Mickey Sullivan, and then they throw him back out on the street and follow him and bring him back in. And so we kind of skipped the first round of this, and he's just chasing a dude and catches him. And that's where they had like the whole like the, the serial numbers on the nails from the pipe bomb and you know all that stuff. So really just simplifying stuff here. And then uh, because it's a cartoon, ninja gangsters intervene. And I love it because that's what I think the book is missing a little bit is it doesn't have to happen, but that's what I wish the book had exciting action near the end of it we have some of the stuff in the office in the original story where you do get that but this is like just that really visceral modern fight scene stuff this is a joy to watch reminds well, me of batman's uh, badness yeah we open with you know some of the rooftop cat and mouse stuff the bat cat stuff but yeah there's not really any ninja fight scenes yeah th this was kind of the uh not a bad nail in the coffin. Just there were. There's good nails things. in the coffin. It was, a good it was nail. a, I don't know. <laughs> it was just, it was just kind of like the last thing on the list that start with the visuals. Like, okay, you're not imitating this art. Okay, you're skipping a bunch of stuff. Like, okay, you're telling a different or more refined version of this story. Okay, and then by the time you get to this fight scene, I was like, e okay, <laughs> yeah, this is totally different. Yeah. That this other thing was like a detective story with kind of action and this is a modern cartoon based on a comic book yeah and i think that's the important distinction is that with year one and dark knight returns they were recreations and with the last couple like hush and long halloween they have been adaptations mm -hmm. and i think dark knight returns is 
up there with Red Hood. It's like one of the best ones that they've ever done. Mm-hmm. And it's risky to change a bunch of shit. But I found this a lot more rewarding because they did. This is a, a yeah. version where that worked. Both because and they, I, they did a good job too. something we already read. Or for me, so it was fresh. That's what kept me engaged instead of like, okay, and then this thing is going to happen, and then this thing is going to happen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But also just because I like it. I like this final product. It's tight. It's refined. Yeah. yeah. I was going to say that if you're coming into it with these preconceptions, like this has to be exactly like this, or it has to be on the same level or something like that, and you don't allow room for stuff to be kind of different, that's a shame. But sometimes you can get done dirty, and you can be open and then the thing just sucks. You know, if you're going to do a different version of it, just at least do it awesome so that they can at least rest easy that like, hey, you know, but at least you did a service in a different way. Yeah. You yeah. Didn't just poop on it. Well, I remember hearing people criticize like Dark Knight Rises for not being what they expected, like story-wise for things not to yeah. happen. And sometimes you can do that in, in the sense of like, the character wouldn't do this. This doesn't make sense. But if it's just like the story beats are different, Mm-hmm. Good. That's, that, yeah, that's really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, that's a, on a you. Criticism of you. Yeah, not a criticism of you. Yeah, that's your. That's your thing to deal with. Yeah, exactly. So Catwoman kind of swoops in and helps with the the ninja fight here. Sorry, ninja gangster fight. Because <laughs> they're, they're in triads. suits. Nobody's wearing a mask. They're Chinese. They're in suits. You're the racist now. This is a dope fight, also. Yeah, and Mickey runs off into the sewer and runs straight into Grundy. Batman ends up taking him in. He is not very subtle as they're questioning him. And Gordon's like, you know, you really need to work on your detective skills. And I like that. Still an early Batman, as we know. And Combined with like, chasing Catwoman on the roof. Mm-hmm. Her being better at jumping than him. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He kind of stumbles and rolls like, it off. Oh. <laughs> Measure it up. And uh, Gordon pins the whole thing on Falcone citing Occam's razor, saying, you know, simplest explanation, you know, like it's got to be. At this point, Alberto sends flowers to Dent's hospital room and tells his dad, who is furious and immediately puts him in his place in a very uncomfortable and violent way. Harvey sneaks out in his hospital gown, and Gordon finds him outside Falcone's place, just like wandering. And Harvey won't come with him. And he, for the first time, refers to himself in the third person. And Gordon does something that I cannot get behind. (laughs) Speaking of what a character would not do, Gordon sees him like roaming the streets when mobsters are trying to kill him. And he's outside their home base and he's like, okay, I'm going to give you my gun. Please be safe, right? See you later. And then drives away. I have very few issues with this adaptation, but that was like, holy shit. That would cost you your job if you forfeited your police issue gun. I think uh, you get leeway as commissioner and you're giving it to the district attorney. Like, who's going to know? Like, no, the district he, attorney like, is the guy who would prosecute the case. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's exactly. true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was pretty Sweeney Todd. I see you, Joanna. I feel you, Joanna, outside your window at the place. Maybe that's just a me <laughs> reference. No, Sweeney Todd, guys? I saw it the once. The only Tim Burton movie I like is Batman 89. But... Hmm. It's a good one. Wait, is that true, really? <laughs> no, Big Fish is the best. Tim oh, that... actually, you know what? Big Eyes is the one I like. Big with Eyes? Amy Adams? Yeah, and Christoph yeah, Waltz? That's a Tim Burton movie? Yeah, it's, mm-hmm. it doesn't look like one, but... Oh, it... it's about the... She paints the characters that all have big eyes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, great movie. Nobody likes Sweeney Todd, Evan. I mean, it's not even... It's his movie, but it's not his story. It's, it's awesome. It's a bunch of singing and throat slitting. It's not really my favorite things. <laughs> a lot of people love it, though. Yeah, I think it's great. I love pies that are made of people. Also, so <laughs> it's a big selling point. Something I didn't catch the first time I watched it, because it's a brief moment. I was like, oh, they didn't have the part where Batman leaves a plate of Thanksgiving food for Grundy in the sewer, but they do, and I'm glad that they included it. And then uh, Chen and the rest of his men are massacred at a restaurant. Batman and Gordon visit calendar man Julian Day, and he suggests that Harvey's absence implies maybe he's a suspect. He's a person of interest here. Like, why come he's not here with you guys right now? Dasmalchian's self-assured creepiness 
is fantastic. Like, again, in sort of a Hannibal Lecter thing, he just very... Oh, but that's why he's not here? Oh, I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I like his voice. Very condescending, too, you know? Just like, I've got this shit figured out, like, while you guys are chasing yourselves in a circle. He's big in this, too. He actually looks formidable in, in stature. Yeah, instead of just weird. You know, yeah. this is maybe the second time in a row now where he's taken a dumb character and made me like him. Hmm. It's got the magic touch. Yeah. Dave makes a reference to Joker, and Batman like runs to his cell immediately and realizes it's vacant. And the guard admits to being blackmailed or his family threatened or something. And she the, gave it up quick too. That guy. Yeah. I don't even think Batman said anything to that. That guy just crumpled. That guy's been like for days, just like, oh my god, I got to tell somebody. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now, the dents return home, and Joker is decorating the tree. We know this scene before, but. Troy Baker singing Deck the Halls in a Mark Hamill impression is glorious. <laughs> I really, really liked that scene. Troy Baker is one of my few cons. What? Yeah, and it's, I think Troy Baker is an excellent actor. He's one of the main characters in Last of Us, which is an amazing performance in anything, movies, TV, whatever. So he's excellent. But his version of Joker is such a Mark Hamill impersonation that every time I hear it, I just, I'm thinking like, man, I wish this was Mark Hamill. I don't it feel just, that way. Like when, because he was in uh, the Ninja Turtles one too, right? Isn't that where we first heard him as Joker? Maybe, and he's the Joker in the Batman Origins game, the one that's a prequel to all the other ones. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I don't know, I, I really like him because it is so on brand. And I mean, he does switch it up and do his own thing with it at times, but... You can't top that style, and uh, I like that someone else is bringing it. Honestly, this was one of my few cons, but I talked about Jason O'Mara, right? And how he just talks like a regular guy in the bat suit. Would it kill these voice actors to do just a little bit of Keaton or something that any of these, any of these live-action Batman have done in their voice, and all of them are just like, well, Conroy just talked right? No one has that voice. Stop doing normal talking Batman. It's strange to me. I'm with you on the Jason O'Mara because I'm not super in. I mean, he's okay, but I'm not super into that one, but I like Jensen Ackles a lot. I, I think his, he's red good, was great. but I think he's a better Red Hood. He's young. He's Jason Todd's age at this point. It's something in all of these animated films. It's not a, a critique of... I don't like the Joker voice. You don't like the Batman yeah. voice. <laughs> Let's just throw this whole thing out. No, no. It's not necessarily a critique of either actor's performance. I think it may just be like a directorial choice with the style they want for these. But it's something I want. Like the whole groundbreaking Keaton Conroy era that changed everything that came after it. At a certain point in the animated films, they're just like, hey, what if we just stopped doing that? And he's just Bruce Wayne voice all the time. Mm. It just makes me wonder if maybe they're a little afraid of Christopher Nolan backlash or Bat Bale backlash. And honestly, I I would believe they did that voice for Batman. That's so over the top and stupid. I would far prefer that than just like bank teller voice as Batman. Mm. It's not scary. You know, it's not a disguise. This is a Batman who, again, is like, what Kevin and I have talked about before, that <laughs> you're not going to give me anything on that. Um, he's, he's more intimidating through his actions, like torturing people. Like It's not so much the voice that he uses to intimidate. Yeah, but like he's talking to the police commissioner and the district attorney, not disguising his voice at all. Why? Uh, yeah, I guess that's a reasonable it, point. <laughs> I still think that I also wouldn't want to try to find a way to make those sounds all the time. I don't want to be like, give me a cookie, like all the time. But I like some passion in some of these performances. But I guess it also needs to be called for. Or maybe all these guys deserve a vocal effect, a la Affleck or something. Let them talk regular and apply a thing to their voice. I like that for him, but I wouldn't do that across the board. I mean, think about the influence, though, of, let's say, Keaton's choice not just in Batman, put Batman aside, think of every action movie from fucking, like, Sin City all the way to now. Like, everyone has the Clint Eastwood 
gravelly, gruff, tough thing all the time. Regular dudes, no costumes, fucking whatever Mel Gibson action movie, tough Batman voice, and yet Batman doesn't have it. That's all I'm saying. I like it. And when his eyes go dead, the hell I send him to will seem like heaven after what I've done to him. Come on now. Shut your fucking face. I am not in danger, Skyler. I am the danger. I'd make you take it all. I'd roll over and let you give it to me. I'm honestly not trying to make this sound gay. No one is. It's just happening. The only ground that I give the criticism is your criticism that it makes it that much less likely that they wouldn't just know he's Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The actual voice, I like a lot. Okay. It's just in these movies, the more of them that we watch, the more I'm like, give me something, guys. Sure. Especially if you've seen something, too, where a person is capable of something. Yeah. I've caught enough random episodes of Supernatural to know that this guy could sound angry if he wanted to. So yeah, I'm sure that people are perfectly capable, but I think that it might be hard. Oh, I can imagine the challenge of trying to summon like a performance when you're not actually acting out a scene with another person and you're not like lost in the scenery and the moment and stuff. You know, you're in a studio setting by yourself in your pajamas and you need to act a certain way. Yeah, I think that that would be difficult. And I bet people who even do a good job in this one setting might have a hard time in this setting because all of these other things play into their ability to perform a certain way. Oh, yeah. I give props to actors who do voiceover. You know, they have no scene partner or like people who do these big spectacle movies. I mean, people shit on Marvel as being like cheap or gimmicky or whatever kind of popcorn movie. And to me, I think that that acting is very impressive if you look at what Downey or Chris Pratt or some of these people, the emotion that they bring when you look at the sets and they're all fucking green screen. Sure. And you see the heart that they're bringing when they're just looking at fucking Ben's bright green t-shirt over here <laughs> and no person, all around them. there's nothing there at all. Mm -hmm. And they are bringing their A game. And that to me is very impressive. So I, I, I don't want to diss the actors. Avengers. Oh. Oh, got it. All right. Bye. Yeah, I know. It's <laughs> right over your head. It's too good. <laughs> So Joker easily disarms Dent, who had Gordon's gun. He also produces a twenty two with a pacifier. And Harvey is kind of struck, like, where did you get that? And Joker's like, why are you missing one? And I like this little uh, cat and mouse. is like he's already suspecting something, even before anybody else really is. Joker poisoned Maroney's men at a restaurant which we see from him dumping a body in his trunk as Batman approaches. And Maroney's pretty indignant. He's blaming Batman for this escalation. You know, like, these crazy motherfuckers weren't all over the place until you came around, you know. Joker visits Falcone, who is asleep in bed, after we find he removed all the bullets from his gun. I like that scene. It's a pretty badass power move. And like his run in with Dent, he wants Holiday for himself. So he's kind of shaking down everybody involved from any angle, saying, like, yo, I'm the fucking serial killer in this town. Falcone's guard chases him in a shootout down this whole staircase. And as he gets outside, Joker's gone and is killed off screen by Holiday. Bruce and Alfred back at the cave review their suspects, Maroney, Carla Vitti, Falcone himself, and ignoring a fifth suspect because, quote, he doesn't like it. They mention that he was turned down for a gun after uh, an unusual psych evaluation, to which I thought that was hilarious that in America... <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. You That's can buy. I know this is a fictional story. Yeah, you can buy a gun without any of that. But in <laughs> Gotham City, somehow they are the benchmark utopia for psychological testing on gun purchases. And the implication is that this is Harvey Dent. That's the mysterious. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, that he gets to be the district attorney. He has like weird <laughs> psychological aberrants. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. They're not all privy to the results of all of the tests. You can't have a gun, but you can put away anyone you want. That's fine. That Sorry, was an interesting addition that they brought to it, for sure. 
At Falcone's yacht charity event, he is kind of revving up this speech with a big setup. And Alberto is like, oh, shit, he's finally going to acknowledge me, right? And he introduces Bruce Wayne, the son I never had. And we see Alberto storm out, feeling betrayed. Uh, Bruce and Selena pretty much break up here, which is a big change. He catches her on the way out going like, hey, when did you steal my watch here? And I think, tell me if I'm wrong here, her answer is a line she said earlier as Catwoman. Because I think when Dent came in, when they were at the warehouse full of money, she says curiosity can get you killed oh, around here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she I says no, that. I noticed that too, because that was like, oh, that would have been a giveaway if he was paying attention. When there were a few double entendres before that, when she's breaking up with him, she says, um, well, we're just two different people, implying both that different from each other, but also both of us are, are two, two different people. people yeah. Mm-hmm. And, then, and then immediately after that, she also says, see you on the other side. Like, see you on the other side of our relationship, but also see you when we're being the other people that we are. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Look at you taking notes for once. Wow. Holy the romance crap. in the scene was palpable and I was drawn in. <laughs> oh, <so laughs> Hyper focused. The Gordons and the Dents meet up not at their quiet home on New Year's Eve. This is what we saw in the book. They were kind of by the fireplace, but in Gotham Square, like a Times Square looking thing for the big New Year's countdown, very public. And the Dents sort of argue about their inability to have kids. And Gilda catches herself. She's like, why can't you be more like, and kind of shakes it off. And then Joker flies by in this little plane, attempting to gas everybody. And this was a great shot in the comic because I remember him flying and Batman like upside down looking at his face, like bent over. And I really like the way that they did this scene it plays out almost better in animation yeah the, I mean, just the overall action of it is conveyed much better than it was in the original yeah these backgrounds and cityscapes in this look really nice too yeah they look really good and it all blends really well as i said a million times like scale is one of my big things scale mm-hmm. with gotham city especially because it's supposed to be one of the biggest cities in the country and since this is not real i want them to take some uh liberties with making a scene even bigger than it is yeah and it mm. looks enormous in this. Every scene where you see the city is giant. Lots of matte backgrounds or like, you know, static imagery of the city that just looks fantastic. Yeah, and they, they end the scene with that giant clock tower, just like in the book, where the plane crashes, but Batman has swooped Joker up onto this ledge. I thought that when I watched that, that it was sort of inconsiderate of Batman. I know that I've seen other cartoons and stuff where somehow in these Big Ben type huge clocks that there's some sort of like access door to the face yeah. of the clock. But I was like, is that even a thing in real life? And if it isn't, then that is a dick place to hang a person <laughs> because he's leaving them for the cops, but it's like not at all convenient. They're going to have to go up and get up there. <laughs> yeah, but that blows, actually, dude. Well, you can starve or roll off. Your choice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I didn't kill him. Totally. It's in the hands of fate. When they're in the air and Batman is accusing him of being Holiday, oh. I like this part because, you know, Joker was already just like we've seen before saying... There's only room for one mass murderer in this town, right? But when he says, like the corn colonel always says, I won't be number two. I didn't understand that joke. Number oh, two is poop. I understand. As you said, it's shit. Okay. I eat I a lot of popcorn. So I don't. Maybe that's why. If I could just continue to drive this home. I, th- I thought of a, a late punchline to the uh, clock thing uh, where Batman skedaddles and he's like, time will tell what happens to him or something like that. <laughs> Is this a Joel Schumacher <laughs> no. movie? There was one other double entendre in the, um, not really double entendre, but it's foreshadowing Harvey and Gilda in their fight. When he says, he's like, I'm only one man. Ah, uh, yes. I like, oh. Ah, I get it. All right, so Selena finds Alberto on the deck of this yacht, pining over his father's disapproval. And he tries to kiss Selena, kind of misreading the situation. Like, I, I really feel like I can talk to you, you know, and she's listening, and then he fucking makes a move, and she, like, it would have been humiliating the way she's like, oh, Jesus Christ, you know? <laughs> but also, we, did you guys know the thing that happens later? 
the revelation of to who Selena Kyle is. You're right. Yeah, because yeah, that is hinted at in the book too, and I totally. It's revealed in the side story, Catwoman in Rome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are you talking about? Well, she's like, we can't. Oh, no, because it's like a, a Luke and Leia thing. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh. Also, you're a creepy little weirdo. That's but. funny. I did not, when he's like, oh, yeah, you're so easy to talk to. I did not fucking think, oh, yeah, familial, subconscious thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah she's not, it's not just like, she's not disgusted by him, but she's like, oh, no. Not, not like that, yeah. Because uh, I was wondering the whole time watching this, like, are they going to do that in this story? Because mm-hmm. I don't think they're going to make a Catwoman when in Rome movie to no. go along with this. So uh-huh. Now, what's funny is Batman swoops in at this exact moment and is like, get away from my girlfriend. Like, <laughs> super <laughs> weird. And then, yeah, exactly. And then <laughs> she says Bruce out loud. And I was like, oh, fuck. Uh-huh. What a, you know, right? And so Alberto is... Obviously, like, wait, you're Bruce Wayne, and the whole fucking thing gets out of hand. Batman's like, yeah, I am, and you're the fucking holiday murderer, and just kind of lays into him, and he gets shot mid-conversation. So think about in the book, right, he's out there feeling sad by himself. We sort of see Carla come out as he's fallen off, but he was alone when he got killed there. Mm-hmm. With this, we're... They put with- so much work into showing you that... He did not make it out of this scene. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. he's not the one this time, right? Yeah, do not have any doubts that he died here. Exactly, there's a lot of witnesses here, and then Batman... We see him fall into... And he falls into a propeller, I think. We see <laughs> it. <you know. laughs> They're like, hey, do not suspect that he is the killer. Watch him get chopped up. <laughs> and then Batman almost lazily chases Holiday. Because, like, why didn't he just grab Null up to that upper deck right then and pounce that motherfucker? Like, already time has passed. What is this, the third victim or something? You know, like, he runs through the crowd of people and fucking loses the guy on a self-contained ship. I was kind of mad at that, like... Well, there were so many people. I bought into it because of that. Yes. Like, yeah, that would be hard to maneuver through that many people. It took a couple seconds, and this is a man that I know to not take a couple seconds to do yeah. that. Yes. Yeah, you got to was... work a lot harder, kid, if you want to be good at this. Yeah, there was some hesitation. Yeah, I guess maybe that's just young, dumb Batman learning. And also, she just gave away my secret identity. I'm still kind of reeling. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that guy fell into the propeller. He's, just... yeah, right. he's like, well... well deal with in this moment. Yeah. I'm yeah. glad he's dead, because that guy just found out who I was. <laughs> yeah, I better take off. Batman meets Gordon and Dent to tell them what happened. That he was wrong about Alberto, and now they basically have to start over the investigation. And this is the end of part one. And originally when I saw they were doing it in two parts, I was like, how the fuck are they going to cut it in half? Like, where is that going to go? But if you take the original twist ending killer from the source material and kill him on screen... That's a pretty good way to end. You know, that's when mm-hmm. I was fully invested. Me too. Like, okay, because now I don't know what's going to happen. I'm excited for this. Mm. This has been different. Now it's different. Good. Yeah. Now, the first time I watched this, I didn't catch it, but there is a post credit scene. Did you see it? Nope. I did, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alberto's funeral. Bruce says hello to Falcone, who introduces his date, unnamed, but she extends her hand, shakes hands with Bruce, and you see the vines come out from her sleeve to his hand. Mm -hmm. Now, the second one, there is no cold open. We just go straight through the credits, and again, they kind of animate the later chapters that we're about to see from the Tim Sale drawings. And we get a new scene where Bruce and Pamela are in this dreamy field lovingly looking at each other and she's taking control of his mind. She's getting him to sign over his assets. We cut to real life. We get that scene from the book where it's the like, I can't resist you. And she kind of wraps him up in the vines in the wall and says, no man can. Again, where the new designs are more effective. I'm sorry to sound like a crass nerd boy, but like this is hot as fuck versus in the original that's sort of like, cut from a distance and all no. the faces are kind of weird looking and i love the character designs in the original and the design of women but no this is a much more effective like like he's being yeah. seduced by this person who i am also attracted to i believe that yeah just that idea of her drawing him in and like enclosing them 
We saw that in the book. It's the last page of that issue, but it was so much better in animation. I remember being repulsed, and I think that we were all on the same page yeah. in the book, where we're like, oh, but the leaves on your skin under your clothes, and like the way that they were tiny and disgusting looking, <laughs> and we, we all weren't feeling that, so this is a, a big improvement. Yeah, if that's what they want us to feel, what he's like, the seduction of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we skip the next book pretty much entirely. Uh, we gloss over Just smart. the way that they cut this in half where they did to skim these chapters just like they did at the beginning of the other film. It's very symmetrical. It feels very natural to do it at this place in time, setting up part two. So we kind of skim past Valentine's and St. Patrick's Day. There's just like a, a couple frames of each one to let you know they happened. Ivy has apparently bled him dry at this point and taken over everything in his life. Catwoman busts in and frees Bruce of those creepy chest vines. She slashes through him with her claws. And this is a great fight. Yes. She kicks Ivy's ass, but that is no small feat. I mean, the fact that a non-superpowered character like her could take down Ivy is, is very impressive to watch. Yeah, She's this a lot smaller and not as strong as Batman. She can still pull it off. And this is another one of those, like, hugely benefiting from modern animation abilities and another one of those things that's making me think that Poison Ivy is super, super dope now. Like, yeah, conjuring these Jumanji monster vines from nowhere and like, oh my God, you can do so many cool... Because it, what's kind of tight about her, I think, is like, it's not very cool to think that you could conjure a rose bush. No one cares about that. <laughs> um, but when you liken her abilities more to like somebody with mental powers or some sort of like telekinetic ability where yeah, she's like objects far away. Yeah. She could pretty much like summon whatever she wants from the earth kind of instead of like Magneto shaping a building, how she wants, or he wants, you know, she could take, a group of trees and do what she wants with them or something. And now that I'm thinking about it more like kind of a limitless with, this doesn't make sense, but limitless with parameters ability sure. that she's like incredibly overpowered because she has like the whole planet at her disposal and she can more or less do whatever she wants with it. Well, Tom King and his run did a series with her. Oh, really? Batman, and it was played like that. Like she's incredibly awesome. powerful. I'll have to read that. Cause I have really, like I said, grown to, like her character a lot, but also just respect that she is one of, if not the most overpowered of the classic Batman yeah. rogues. You know, yeah. when you play her as beyond just the seductress, it opens up so many more possibilities of how to use that character. And this version of Ivy is not really that, but generally she is more like more of an understandable villain where she's coming mm -hmm. from, what her goals are. Yeah. That she's not like a maniacal murderer or something like that. And I think yeah. sort of the way that actually, because I've been continuing to watch the HBO show after we reviewed it, you know, Harley was saying like, you know, you and me team up and do some more evil shit. And she's like, you know, if uh, saving the planet from destruction is evil, then sure. Yeah, I'm on board. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's hilarious. Like, it's funny when writers, like they'll overuse the word plant a lot you know me and my love for plants or plants over people or like, st stuff like that thing. i'm like you know it's a little on the nose like you, you want to talk about like nature yeah or the earth or the global welfare <laughs> the ecosystem you know? yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> man uh, i see a daffodil and i'm like fuck yeah daffodils that's my <laughs> thing i love them it's always like there's some industrial site that's going to replace this they're going to remove this great tree i gotta stop some rare plant is going to go extinct because they're going to put in these new housing projects, you know. Low-income housing for thousands mm -hmm. of people yeah. who need a place to live. Bruce realizes that three months have passed once he snaps out of this and that Holiday is still killing people. We skip the entire Riddler story in April Fool's Day, and I don't miss it. Scarecrow breaks out on Mother's Day, and this is reimagined very effectively. We use the same dialogue. Batman's like, give me a name or I'll... And then he found out that the Scarecrow was a decoy. He was a Scarecrow. He was made of straw, right? And he had gotten away. But in this, he says the same line, give me a name or I'll... And like looks down and Scarecrow had fucking injected him with the toxin. And again, for animation, 
I'm never tired of looking at Scarecrow Toxin. Oh, yeah. This design of Scarecrow is really, really cool. Yeah. There's been a, a couple times, and it always makes me really happy, where I think a really fast thing in response to a scene that I'm watching, and then it instantly gets answered for me, as if the cartoon was thinking about what was in my head. And yeah. I thought, where did Scarecrow get that horse? And then following this scene, there's the news and a man talking about Scarecrow escaping Arkham and stealing a horse from their property. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, me too. Thanks, (laughs) Thanks, guy. Sophia comes to Falcone and she says, look, I freed Crane from the inside. You know, I've been doing this shit for you. I want a seat at the table. I gave him a pony. (laughs) And (laughs) much like Alberto... Falcone is like, I'm not trying to give up this power. I'm not trying to look like I need a protege. Like, I'm going to be aging out of this shit. Like, a little more tact and sensitivity this time. And oh, yeah. I don't know if that's because he treats her better or because he's guilty over his death. I think Falcone is humanized way more in this. Yes. He's still a bad guy. You still want him to lose, but he's along with everyone, but especially him, it's just much more human. I think what you acknowledge there, if they had put in one more beat about him feeling some guilt about that prior to him saying that to her, that, yeah, I really believe that as a motivation. Combining that with the fact that they also make Falcone and Alberto's relationship worse. Because before he was just kind of like ignoring him and and saying, you know, it's Mm -hmm. not for you, you're kind of weak. This he's actively like, they have violence and tension between them. Not hate, but there's pain. So that they could do that and also make me feel that he feels guilt and sorrow at the same time. Yeah, it, it seems it's like it's probably from insecurity because both when Alberto and Antoni question his policies, that's when he freaks out. You know, it's like, oh, you presume to tell me how to run my business. Uh-huh. That's when he gets off the rails. Both the people are who are on his side, you know. Yeah. In Wreck It Ross, they have the scene with the <laughs> su- it, the support group, and Zangief is it's like it's like a villain's support group, and and Zangief has this like, just because I am bad guy does not mean that I am bad guy line. Mm. That's, mm. How feel, that's how I feel about this dude. I'm glad I interrupted you. <laughs> that's a very Evan Vaught version of that thought (laughs) like you'll say good food is good or something like that's true you know like you're not supposed you're not supposed to use this all my jokes are very timely so every time you guys keep talking for way too long then i lose my opportunity like it's all about timing with me no i was just saying like the fact that you chose that line is very on brand of like, if, if my jokes man, are lackluster, I'm it's because of man. you guys, <laughs> not because my jokes are <laughs> bad. <laughs> Gordon and Dent go to Wayne Manor. They confront Bruce after he was the only unaccounted for guest at the yacht party who left without giving a statement. And he had a pretty plausible story about he was covering up on this affair. He didn't want any paper trail of him being there. He left on the Dinger, as he called it, I think one of the smaller boats attached to it. And he said, I'm sure you... Dingy. Dingy. He's like, I'm sure you noticed it was missing. Then Dent kind of gets in his face and and pretty forcefully asks, well, why did you sign over all your assets to Falcone? And that's a pretty bad coincidence. Bad luck, Bruce. Yeah. And he said, look, look, I was manipulated. That has already been reversed and corrected. Like, that, that is not something that I had any choice in doing i was pinned uh, against a flower wall i I couldn't do anything about it (laughs) i was fucking (laughs) yeah i was having stand up wall sex with a plant lady (laughs) (laughs) well when you put it that way it sounds a little weird but flashback to thomas wayne and i loved this part in the book saving a young carmine at wayne manor and bruce blames that life-saving event for entangling his family with the mob and getting his parents killed eventually. Alfred quips that hopefully, and he gets pretty rough with Gordon on the way out the door and says, hey, hopefully you can do more justice for these victims than you did for the Waynes and kind of closes the door in his face. Good day. I can't remember what the lines were exactly, but 
I liked the interaction with dude as he's laying on the table and like young Bruce. Yeah. There's like a nice exchange. I thought, do you know who I am? Or like, do you yeah. know my father yeah, is yeah. the Roman? Do you know who I'm going to be? Yeah, yeah. 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 The Roman. Yeah. Oh, smart. I think that there's something that's always, and I don't know why, but it always exists in, in like mobster stuff. But, the, but this kind of like, uh, you know, quiet, but violent, yeah, gentlemen, family, like this weird mix of cultures that exists like in the mob in this like civilized gangster lifestyle and stuff. And that struck me as one of those exchanges, you know, where we're being very revealing, but saying very little. It's not aggressive, you know, or, or like those kinds of scenes in those kind of movies where it would strike you as something very passive and maybe like a really passing quiet conversation or something. But in reality, they're exchanging some real truths or some, you know, heavy threats or something. Yeah. Some serious life threats, but it comes across in like a very chill way. I always like that stuff. Yeah. For storytelling, it's awesome. Like I, I mentioned watching that Aaron Sorkin show newsroom and I told Angela last night, it's kind of funny to me. I will be cracking up like loudly laughing at, scenes that do not have big obvious jokes like Mm -hmm. they're all just situational because you know these characters and these remarks that blow by so quickly Mm -hmm. that i'm getting a huge kick out of because i'm invested in the characters and what's happened but if you just like watch this scene by itself nothing would register to you as as funny at all you know Mm -hmm. yeah that's nice there's also a bit in that scene that you mentioned where young Bruce is talking to Carmine as he's on the, the sort of makeshift operating table. He says criminals are a superstitious lot or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, paraphrases the... Uh, it was year one, right? Where that, that was yeah, from. Yeah, cowardly and superstitious Yeah, lot. exactly. I thought that was interesting for him to say, of all people. This overall is a more intertwined revision of their stories because that's another thing that makes Carmen more interesting and more sympathetic having him be involved with Bruce from a young age even if it's just that one moment yeah and like giving him the beginnings of the idea of superstition and the coin and Mm -hmm. you only get what you take and all that kind of stuff Moroni visits his dad Luigi for Father's Day and this was like in the book very strong godfather vibes where he's like tending the tomatoes in the yard and shit but Mm -hmm. he apparently is having an affair with Sophia who's in the car and he's like yo stay here so the old man doesn't flip out and Luigi is killed right there at the table mid conversation just the two of them Sophia runs up to help that puts her as the only other person on the scene which to the viewer is also very suspicious now if I remember right it was Dark Victory where she was the killer, right? Yeah, that's where she comes back. Yeah, okay. Yeah. That's worth mentioning, though, because Alberto's gone. So mm-hmm. Yeah, so now you think who, maybe well, who's the new killer going to be? Maybe it is her. We've had mm-hmm. precedent for that, yeah. So Moroni takes his father's advice, and he makes peace with Dent. He visits us at his office. <laughs> Dent is very, like, afraid. He grabs a letter opener behind his back or whatever. But he offers dirt on Falcone if he'll get immunity right like hey if you'll clear my family i'll give you the big bad batman then catches scarecrow at his uh bank heist and i love how he just swoops in fucking you know scarecrow's doing his fucking shit and batman will just like drop in jump kick him in the back and then pounce back you know like kind of keeping a distance and doing it really smart like a video game did he get you like well, i gotta play that game <laughs> and he tries to do a game <laughs> yeah, I'll come back and do it again. I got my PS5. Don't tell anyone. But. Oh, right. Yeah. And then Hatter knocks him out. And I'm not sure how he is tall enough to do so, but he hits Batman in the back of the head and they get away. So from here, a shooter attempts to kill Harvey while they're watching fireworks on the 4th of July with Gilda and the Gordons. And right as he's about to be shot, Catwoman knocks him out of the way. And they both, that's funny, my notes, I wrote that they fucked up the gunman. But the way the page cuts it off, Catman saves him and they both fuck. That's where, 
<laughs> That's the line break. Hell yeah! <laughs> it's like I don't remember that. Interesting choice. Yeah, and uh, Harvey pursues the guy because he actually hits Catwoman with a rock in the neck, the yeah. back of the neck that kills people. Yeah, for real. Um, so Harvey pursues this guy underground, and they have this sort of '80s cop movie fight, which is super cool. In the meantime, it's kind of cut back and forth. Batman does catch Hatter and Scarecrow, just like in the book. Then they add a beat where he grabs Crane's arm and turns it back on him, gassing himself like Batman begins. I only wish we had got a little bit of the, the point of view on that one. What he sees? Crane. I think that Harvey having to do all that stuff is a little like the movie where these series of events like every one of them is bringing Two-Face out a little bit, like, more and more. Yeah. More and more trauma. More yeah, more yeah, violence. like, uh, yeah, exactly, like, force him into a, a scenario that's intense and might lead to violence and stuff, and it's kind of egging it out of him. Honestly, looking at this stuff in the same context of just talking about Harleen, I'm seeing all the little steps to kind of unlocking his dark side in the same way that yeah. we saw those with her. There's even a thing, and I'm not quite sure what we're specifically supposed to take from it, but when he's got the assassin and they're fighting, he says, like, you tried to kill me. And the guy said, well, if I was trying to kill you, you'd be dead. Yeah. So then, like, specifically, what were they trying to get? Were they just trying to egg him on, or were they trying to put him in that situation? No. I don't think they're the ones who were responsible for killing the assassin. No. Or it was about Gilda or something? I, I thought he was trying to kill Gilda. Uh-huh. And it just missed because nothing happened to Gilda. She was standing in the same spot. That was what I took from it in that Catwoman bumping them out of the way or whatever was enough to disrupt it. That he wasn't the target. That was what I took. Mm-hmm. Harvey does wake up. Uh, he had been knocked out in the fight. And then he finds the guy dead with the holiday trademark pistol and blood on his own hands. And... At home, I think the same night, he remarks to Gilda that the basement door was left open. You know, like when you live with somebody, hey, you left the door open. And she's like, I haven't been down there. And so, okay, he blacked out. A guy is dead. There's another thing about, okay, now something's off in my own house. I'm killing like, people. I'm leaving doors open. <laughs> this, What's going on? No, but like this dude is dissociating, you know. Yeah. Batman is there. He also has a line there that's very small where he says, well, would you rather be back with... Ah, never mind. Yeah. And Batman is there in the basement and finds the holiday gun. Now, in the comic, this is when Gilda finds the gun in the basement. So, again, reimagining these moments getting us to question what we're watching along the way. I like it. Mm -hmm. I think it serves to make us question, but it also, in the end, refines the conclusion. Yeah. It makes things a lot simpler, so you're not left going like, but wait, what about this thing? Yeah. How does that support this conclusion? Yeah, we do have a lot Mm -hmm. of whatabouts in general when it comes to these mystery stories. Batman presents the evidence to Gordon while Harvey begins to hear voices in court. So, you know, he's kind of coming to terms with like, look, all signs are pointing to Dent. I've got the evidence and everything. Like, we need to take this seriously. Meanwhile, we get dude in the courtroom starting to fucking hallucinate and hear voices. You know, of course, the famous moment where Maroney's recanting his testimony. He's kind of playing the room for laughs. And he mentions Father's Day and says, oh, what, like Father's Day? And then Luigi Moroni sends his regards and splashes in with the acid. It makes me wonder why the change of heart. Did he plan to publicly shame him? Is that why he didn't do this when he went to Dent's office and offered to make peace and rat? or? Yeah. You think that's what it was, the public thing? I think it, I think he, entirely when he said the idea was you need to make peace until you end war, his thought is make peace with Falcone. And then so this is all just a setup. So at that time, when he's going to meet with Dent and he's like, you know, my father said to make peace and blah, blah, blah. 
And he's like, I knew it couldn't have meant that. So there's only one other thing it could have meant, right? And that's cooperating with the law. So you think that was just bullshit? There was no change of heart? That was his plan? Yeah, that was a misdirection. Gotcha. Harvey spends almost no time in the hospital and escapes almost immediately, uh, I believe, to go back after Falcone. Or is it Maroney? Yes. No, or, no, he's in the hospital, and they like leave the room, and they come back, and he's gone. Yeah, but where? Wh- who is he going after? Oh, Maroney. I, I wasn't sure if he was going to meet Falcone to like make a move against him, or if he was going to find Maroney, or what? I think Jem was going after Maroney. Okay. I wanted to remark that Josh Demel's Two Face voice is perfect. I almost thought it was a different actor. It's so good, and. Yeah. I'm a huge, huge fan of the way they do it in the animated series, and I think this is what made me think of, oh, well, God, he's so fucking good. Why can't we get a Batman voice that's a little different? You know, kind of got me on that thought because this performance was outstanding. This might be my favorite Two-Face since the OG, you know? Yeah, no, it, I, it sounded like the animated series Two-Face without sounding like an impression of him. What's the guy's name? Is it Richard Mull? Richard Mull from yeah. uh, Night Court. Boy, yeah, he was great. And this boy, this is just... Mm. I didn't think anything about it, therefore it must have been so good. Just very on brand. stick out of my mind. Washed over you. Yep. So Harvey, head bandaged, is with two guys, and they're out there like on the pier to meet somebody. Are they meeting Falcone? Because why would Maroney agree to meet with him? Yeah, they're meeting Falcone, you're right. Okay, so meeting Falcone, he's on the phone, and it's a double cross. He's not coming. The dudes turn on him. He gets away and goes into the water. He barely escapes and winds up back in the sewer. That scene was excellent because, again, Harvey Dent is just a regular guy. Yeah. And they imply, they don't really do it in this, but they imply in the original that he's like really buff. He works out a lot. So much so that they think maybe he's Batman. Yeah. And obviously he has severe personality issues that have now exploded. But this scene is done so well to show you the threat of him, both in the bluff where he hands the phone to the guy and says, oh, he wants to talk to you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the guy's like, what? I'm like, okay. And then in that moment, like disarming the guy, getting behind him, using him as a shield. Mm-hmm taking him over the edge and then breaking his neck in the water. Yeah. Just like that, that, how fast it all happens, but really sells you on like, oh, that's why this guy's a threat. And this is a completely new scene too. And not only in the action there and and what it reveals about him, but the double cross and him thinking that, oh, now because I'm on the other side of the law that I can align with these guys that I've been trying to take down. Like, yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Another new scene at Falcone's birthday party. He's giving a speech and remarks that Carla is late. And she soon arrives as the elevator opens to the penthouse there. Everyone turns and she's dead in the elevator. When originally her part was a lot different. She wasn't like on the news doing interviews, you know, accusing Dent of being holiday and stuff like that. She was digging around the coroner's office looking for cover-ups and shit going wrong, and she got killed in the coroner's office. Wasn't she more adversarial towards Falcone? Of like, you killed my son, or you're responsible, or I'm going to take yeah, over your uh, Yeah, I believe I so. I like there was some more infighting. Yeah, there was a lot more going on with her, and yet this version of it is very effective because she affects Falcone in her death, right? Like, when Harvey's talking about the basement door, Gilda's watching this on TV, and they're both seeing it. And so, I mean, she's integrated without devoting a whole bunch of extra time to her. You know, they didn't just cut her out or blend her with somebody else. You know, they just kind of trimmed it down a bit. Yeah, it makes it like instead my sister died or something, and because (laughs) they also weren't fighting and stuff, then they kind of only had good relations. Yeah, yeah, like if they were adversarial, they're they're mobsters, and you killed the rival mobster. Oh, yeah. well, she was your yeah. sister. Yeah, but she was trying to take my stuff. Versus <laughs> yeah. this. Trying to play with my yeah. toys. Yeah. Nice city. Batman visits Gilda, searching for Harvey. He asks about Harvey's state of mind, and she's basically like, what would anyone's state of mind be dealing with these fucking 
monsters all the time, right? And he remarks that Harvey was an Oxford alum. I didn't know that, right? Alberto had mentioned in multiple scenes that he was. His dad was disappointed. Oh, I should have never sent you to Oxford. You know, the fancy elites toying with your mind. You know, you think you're so much better than me. You know, that kind of shit. Put you through the wall, kid. Put you through the fucking wall. No, um, and so we see that connection. Like, all right, yeah, this is familiar. And then down in the sewer, Dent runs into Grundy again. But this time... He's talking about dying and being reborn, and he looks at him. He's like, is that what happened to you? You died, and you were reborn, and he, like, rips off his bandages, and we see Two-Face for the first time. Like, that was a great, great reveal. I like it. Yeah. <laughs> I like, you can find meaning in anything. and uh, Like Wreck-It Ralph? Yeah, and maybe, maybe Solomon Grundy is, like, incredibly wise, or maybe it's very much the opposite, but it's all about what you derive from stuff. And, uh, You're right, Solomon. I should talk to my dad again. Yeah, oh, oh my God. Yeah, yeah. Tuesday, duh. It, it does come after Monday. You're right. I've never thought about it like that before. Have you guys seen The New Girl? Yeah, it reminds me of Tran. Yeah, exactly. When... Nick's just talking to this Chinese dude in the park all the time oh, yeah, who has totally. no idea what he's saying. It's great. Like the person that only ever casts the mirror and just makes you think more about yep. stuff. Like, oh my God. So deep. Yeah, it's, it's actually just all coming from you. It's like the therapist goes in, how does that make you feel? <laughs> and what yeah. do you think about that? <laughs> I'm afraid we're out of time. I think you yeah. made good progress today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, really think about this for the next week. Do your homework, you know. <laughs> Batman visits Calendar Man, saying that Carla was killed right after she accused Dent on TV of being Holiday. And this is while Dent escaped from the hospital. So all signs now are pointing to him. Grundy and Two-Face team up to derail Maroney's police transport. They knock him off the road. They get him out. Gordon pulls a gun on him saying, look, we found the murder weapons in your basement. We know your holiday. There's actually a beat where Two-Face is incredulous. He's like, wait, you found the guns at my house? He doesn't really take too much time to acknowledge that. He keeps moving and Batman reveals himself under the SWAT uniform just like he did when Alberto was being transported from his cell, right? And it was underground and he stops holiday right there that was almost the end and that was the bit that they took in the dark night too where like the, this has played out a little more like that where they're yeah. you know mm -hmm. in the in the armored cars and they're driving and you know yeah i like the way this played out two-face puts his gun down but maroney is shot from off screen and we see a silhouette there kind of of holiday run off from this fire escape so what do we do with that <laughs> you know i always like these kind of these stories and their misdirects. And this is, a, uh -huh. again, the way that they've taken such a classic and reimagined all these little things is just really working on me so far. Oh, yeah. I think the only, like, hint of a, like, oh, I don't know about this is just the phantasm, like... Six body feet frame. tall? Yeah, the body frame is a little confusing for what, it's, what I think it is underneath, but it's art. I had that thought on the yacht, because the person on the yacht is a man. You can see it under the hat when, like, you know, there's a crowd of people, right? And then mm. Holiday turns around to look. There's a bit of a close-up right there, and it's all in shadow, but that's a dude. And then he runs off to the left. Mm. I'm not sure. Kind I mean, I, know, I agree with you that it looks like a dude, but I, I don't know if that's supposed to just be again, like... Dude looks like a lady. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you... Yes... It reminds me of, especially with the, I know this is like kind of the times, but that hat and the pop collar trench coat and stuff reminds me of Breathless Mahoney in Dick Tracy. Mm. And same kind of thing, you know, this whole time. But, but that's like a totally faceless character and stuff, and it's got a voice changer, so you don't really know what to think about it. But like constantly, the uh, whether it's the figure or other stuff in the story we're like that's not who you thought that's not who you thought whatever yeah. and this kind of like anonymous um silhouetted shooter figure what i took away from this version and i think it's good but maybe i'm wrong is that it was just one person the whole time or in the book it was like it was a couple people yeah yeah so in this i think it's it's supposed to be who it is the entire time 
this is kind of one of those cool scenarios where you could be confused if you've only ever watched the cartoon and you could be double confused if you've also read the book. <laughs> like, I think it almost plays off the fact that maybe you've read this other material. And so therefore you don't, you even more don't know what to think because the whole time it's a mystery anyways. But if you're watching the cartoon after watching the book, you will notice that there are many differences. And now you definitely don't know what to think anymore. It's like, yeah. forget what you think you knew. Yeah, yeah, forget what you thought you forget you knew. <laughs> <laughs> So many droplets. Aren't you happy I'm not there in your garage? I am, yeah. Batman and Gordon lament that they have their man only to find someone else fires the shot when he's right there in front of them. Gordon refutes Batman's Oxford theory saying Dent went to Gotham University. And he says, like, don't let him hear you say that. He's a Gotham U man. That would have worked better after or before he started killing people. Yeah. That was like, totally weird. Yeah. <laughs> He'll kill you. No. <laughs> Later, <laughs> Falcone says to Batman that Dent, quote, broke the rules and that we leave the wives out of it. That is the first real confirmation to me that Gilda's involved again. He draws on Batman. And once again, Catwoman swoops in and saves him. And they peace out to a, a rooftop nearby, and he's really suspicious as to, like, why are you always around here? Like, are you, who are you tailing? And, and she implies by the end of the scene that Falcone may, in fact, be her father. She, like, she'd never met her mother, and he's like, what about your father? And she's kind of, like, looking over... At the terrace where they just were going, um, I think, I, I'm pretty sure it's that that guy that we just kicked in, You're this, supposed in to the be chest. You're the world's greatest detective. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you I, don't take a hint. In her redesign, I feel like you see it a little more, too. Just some like facial similarities mm -hmm. between all the Falcons and her. That's true. Yeah, I could see that. Oh... With the scars and the broad shoulders. <laughs> like just the shape of the chin and the eyes. Oh, yeah, that too. The mustache. <laughs> the great big mustache. Yeah. So as they sort of uh, embrace there on the rooftop, in the distance behind them, and I like that they don't actually cut, it's in the same wide shot, there's an explosion in the distance, and it's at Arkham. Mass exodus in the streets. We see like Ivy and Scarecrow and all the rogues out there. Once again, though, just like the book, they leave Counterman inside in his cell because he lost the coin flip. What a relatable guy. Always never invited <laughs> to the party. It's bald. Sophia questions her father's decision to align with supervillains and letting them out. And no sooner they all show up and have a showdown with all of his goons, she fucking takes them on. Sophia's up there in the balcony shooting down like Scarface. I mean, this is very yep. end of Scarface scene and is taken down by falling debris. And I have a question for the panel here. <laughs> is Grundy Godzilla bulletproof? No. <laughs> is the answer? Hey, I didn't think but, so. Uh, he is, like, he, he comes back to life. So you can't kill him. You can kill him. You can, like, temporarily kill him. So, I guess this Grundy is the Hulk. It yeah. Do <laughs> I don't know, but he looks dope. I love how cool he uh, looks. On this. Yeah. His face is awesome. Little haircut, his coat and shirt. Yeah, he looks good. And as they make their way into the office and, and capture Falcone, we get the, the classic, you know, that iconic wide shot of the whole rogues gallery in this dark office. And I love the way that they did it. Again, I, these redesigns are so cool. Speaking of redesigns, Joker has those, he has like middle school boy hair where it's like, it's parted <laughs> like the McDonald's. Parted yeah, in the middle. Like the, it's like the golden arches and he has like a thing on each side. I didn't like that. Don't make fun of sixth grade Sam. <laughs> I tried. I also tried that for a time. You know, my uh, problem was it wasn't symmetrical because, like, I have sort of a cowlick on the right side, and so this would be like a perfect circle on the left side. Then the other mm. one would kind of go forward, 
And I'm like, why don't they just pick a fucking, you know, yeah. So Two-Face monologues with the gun on Falcone, who's tied up. And as he's about to shoot him, Batman and Catwoman swoop in and, and take on everybody. Again, this is not changed from the book. But to see it play out in animation is so exciting. Yeah. Well, and I, I want to acknowledge how good it works without resting on what is one of the strongest parts of the book is the callback to his father talking about take out the most serious threats first. And You're right. And listen to that, which is really neat and interesting in the book. And this doesn't have that at all, and it doesn't matter. It still works fine without it. It's just an exciting action scene. Yeah, and I think what's what they have to make emotional there, here, they can make more exciting because of the team-up. You know, we, mm-hmm. we talked about Rises earlier, and I got really excited in Rises when we saw just a brief moment of the two of them fighting Bane's goons together on that rooftop. I'm like, yes, more team-up Bat-Cat fights. Like, uh, I really mm-hmm. want to see that. And so this scene was just great. And then, you know, talking about Ivy, she gets both of them wrapped up in vines on the walls across from each other. And we actually cut back to the opening scene of, of this movie, of part two, where they're in the, you know, the dream field. field. Exactly. And she's trying to get in his head again and he just headbutts her. Yeah, and as soon as she's satisfying. unconscious, you know, it all, it all falls away and, and they get free. And Could have had a three way going. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Now we're talking. Dope. See you guys later. That's the stuff dreams are made of. We're only missing Harley. And <laughs> so that's there too. You guys heard of the internet? I'm yeah. You've been there. So here's another little change that they make. So Two Face kills Falcone just as Sophia enters the room. In the original, she lunges at him and goes out the window, right? Catwoman tries to save her. She falls, she vanishes. Scratch face. In this one, it is that she is kind of in shock seeing her dad dead there. She slips and falls. She goes over one of those vines with her foot, falls out the window. Catwoman tries to save her, and we watch her body flatten a cop car. She's fucking dead. Again, Did, no question, just like Alberto. In the original, I didn't get the feeling that Catwoman was trying to save her in the original. She's holding her hand from the fucking ledge. Yeah, I, I, I thought that she was. Doesn't she scratch her, or is that something else from somewhere else? I, yeah, I thought that they, she scratches her during the fall, but I think it's just... I don't okay. think it's on purpose. So here, she's saying, Papa, Dent, you bastard, I'll kill you. And Catwoman jumps on her and says, Sophia, don't. And then they go over the rail. And then? And she's gone. Uh, so, well, so I, I think I, Catwoman. But I think, but I think later, though, <laughs> when you have the stuff with Sophia later, and it's kind of like explaining how she's back or something, that they give you a little like multi-panel. This oh. is how it played out, and this is what you missed. That and might have been a dark victory thing, then. Yeah, yeah. Carmine's dying words are to Selena, who is now unmasked. She goes over to him, and he says, "Louisa." He calls her, I think, Louisa, and she corrects him and says Selena and leaves the room. I imagine that must have been her mother's name since she had specifically mentioned that she didn't know it. Yeah. Was he mistaking her for yeah. Louisa in his yeah, dying yeah, moment? Yeah, had a resemblance. Yeah, I thought so too. Totally didn't catch that. Two-Face turns himself in on the roof, just like in the book. This scene is nearly word for word. They cut to him in his cell later on, and he thinks of Gilda. He seems to have a revelation. And she is destroying the evidence in the basement furnace, just like we've seen before, only this time she's not alone. And her monologue is delivered to Batman. She talks about Alberto being her college sweetheart and implies that... The Falcone family found out that they were going to have a baby out of wedlock, and there's sort of a, I believe, probably a forced abortion yeah. that's going on there. And basically saying that, you know, it ruined her life. And this is, 
this is a thing. It is. It's very much like Gordon giving away the gun. She's like, so what, are you going to turn me in now? Are you going to go tell Gordon? And he just looks at her and he's like, the killing is done? And she's like, yeah, it's finished. And she she corrects him. It's not done. Yeah. Finished. I'm like, oh, semantics. Thanks, bitch. Yeah. But, um... (laughs) I've killed everyone I meant to kill. Yeah. It's over. There's no one left for me to kill. And he walks away. And we get a little epilogue here where Bruce, again, tells Alfred not to expect any trick-or-treaters in this fucked-up city right as the doorbell rings. Uh, We see... Selena hanging on to Bruce and says, I never use this C word here. You're cute when you're wrong, she says. And that's the last line of the film. And she's had this probably very traumatic thing just happen to her. And they reunited. I like that. Didn't fully wash the taste out of my mouth from the previous (laughs) scene ending there. But yeah, that's the finale. Did you see the post-credits scene in part two? No. No. No, I think I did, but I also forgot what that one was, so tell me about it. <laughs> the doorbell rings again. Alfred answers with the bowl of candy again, but this time it's the Flash and Green Arrow. Oh, yes. Yeah. And he says, I believe it's for you, or something like that. Mm-hmm. And what I wonder is, is this a specific setup or reference to what they're doing next or something, or is this just an Easter egg? Easter. Yeah. I have no idea. That seems kind of left field to me. It's just a costumes joke? Like, I wasn't sure. (laughs) But did you guys have any other thoughts on the letting her go? I mean, I had the same thought of, like, that's weird. But then I thought, like, well, who did she kill? Bad people, I guess. Mobsters. (laughs) Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's like, I wish I could have done the same. Yeah, we've we've learned from what we've read recently that it's not that he doesn't want to. (laughs) That's not his thing. So, yeah. And that Harvey was his friend, and they did all that to Harvey. I was okay with it. I had the same initial thought you did, and I just kind of went, I guess that's all right. It doesn't Seems ruin it weird. for me, but it was definitely like, but. <laughs> yeah. Why yeah. are you letting her destroy the evidence? Totally. It's not as if, you know, Two-Face isn't doing a lot of the same stuff, but maybe his crimes in the future is something probably involved innocence or something because later on he's just going to do more supervillain stuff whereas hers is just targeting the mob and it has a, a more sympathetic story i don't know yeah i mean that's one of the things that i to jump ahead to a pro just her overall character arc is way better in this it makes so much more sense it's not out of left field on this one quite as much yeah. mm-hmm. and even when you get to the end and it's there it's like what is your motivation other than like they were mean to harvey and they were making which is enough but it's just is way better in this. Yeah. Yeah, you took the love of my life, you took my child, and then you continue to do this other stuff to this, this new person. Love? Connected with, yeah, yeah, this other love thing. Yeah. Totally. Easter eggs. Anything we didn't mention? I don't think I have any. The, the only other I'm thing I'll point out is as Ben mentioned, the the cityscape, the opening B roll of kind of the bridge into the city reminded me very much of that first matte shot that we get in Batman 89. Like it, it just, and we, we saw it twice. I believe they showed that same bridge at different times overlooking the city. And it just, it reminded me a lot of the first Burton Anton first design. One thing that I, I did like about this one though, in regards to the backgrounds is that they were doing something specific with the coloration that made it the colors were kind of wet or kind of blobby or kind of like a watercolor or something. The blacks would be blacks and then the colored parts would look kind of like a watercolor. Yeah. And I don't think that it was imitating the animated series at all because certainly that would have to look very different. It would have to be in an actual painting, but you couldn't pull off some of the things that they're pulling off here. But the fact that they were just sort of a painted palette just kind of made it a slightly more classic art style which the animated series like was and wasn't that but it certainly was simple and these solid chinned man figures and stuff and more of an early american classic setting but the painted looking backgrounds kind of drove that home a little bit more to me and maybe made a connection that wasn't really there but i liked it stylistically 
Yeah, and shout out to Eric Radomski, who I believe was the one who designed the backdrops, you know, the art direction for that show, because that is such an enduring quality of Gotham City. Mm -hmm. It's funny because the one that stood out to me the most, and even as I've complimented the city, it's when Harvey comes home and he's looking at his house and his kitchen and it's all dark. Mm Mm-hmm. It just looked really nice. It was like a very nice painted image of a home interior. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's get into pros. Just the overall way that it managed to be faithful to the original, excise stuff that didn't need to be there for the length of this, but also maybe just didn't need to be there at all. Yeah. And you still have to give credit to the original because we wouldn't have this without it. And I, I was talking to my wife about that and what makes this better in terms of them streamlining it for this... I mean, this really is a great adaptation. And they do not have to commit to monthly issues where every single case gets equal time because, frankly, they don't all deserve equal attention. And so... Mm -hmm. The original drags because of that. Exactly. That is what freed them up here, I think, is that they weren't beholden to the format. Totally. And the additions that I liked, even for you, it seemed like maybe they were a little gratuitous of like the combat the ninja fight scenes and stuff no i loved it because then that that was more the batman that i like in this more classic batman story i'm good with all of it really it was just those two tiny things of gordon's gun and batman letting her go and and those are minor to me i mean i really liked the changes and i thought it's very hard to take something this beloved and put your own spin on it and actually make it feel more palatable i felt kind of funny simultaneously skeptical and also when i'd seen the trailers thought like oh man this is a this is a turn for the better in regards to animation for me um but having read the book i was like how are they gonna make this (laughs) just how are they even gonna make it interesting to me i'd kind of rather read a detective story than watch a detective story sometimes because if the pace is slow in a book, at least I can read it quicker or something like that. But if, uh, yeah, but sometimes if you're not executing this stuff, well, it can just end up being potentially boring or something. Yeah. And so I was just kind of afraid, like, I don't, I don't really know what that's going to, I wasn't concerned about them doing it justice or something like, but will this be interesting other than the visuals, visuals, (laughs) <laughs> it ended up being really tight. The, them doing their refined version, refined and different version of the story, and then making it also like modern cartoons and doing what it takes to keep us involved and really making it like, this is current. Check out these bitch and fight scenes. And, uh, you know, cool storyline that moves quickly and stay pumped about these awesome fights. And, uh, and unravel it, it, the mystery and be excited at the twists and the turns. Totally. It, it kept me in it. And again, the visuals, I hope that this isn't even them like temporarily embracing this awesome new classical look. Uh, I hope that this is like the beginning of a trend that continues for a bit because I really like how this stuff looks. Well, there was another stylistic thing that I wanted to compliment with those bold outlines. Anytime there was a, a scene or a fight in a very dark place. I thought it looked really, really nice. The first one that stood out to me was in the sewer when he first meets up with Grundy. Yeah. But then mm-hmm. the other one was Catwoman versus Ivy in the dark and study. Because yeah. something about the heavy outlines combined with the darkness on the character, but a little bit of like reflected light on them as well. And that's mm-hmm. what I mean about keeping the Tim Sale vibe, even yeah. though like they don't look anything like him if you take the characters and just set them next to each other. They look nothing alike, but somehow they achieved that use of light and just that shadow, whole light shadow. Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. man. It just feels so true to the original while being nothing like it. That's really the most commendable thing is that it is such a clever adaptation that they there's a reverence for the source material. They didn't just be like, oh, you know, we can make this way fucking cooler, blah, 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 you know. And yet they didn't cop out and just copy it but they really did make it a unique retelling. I mean, this is 25 years later. Mm -hmm. So to breathe new life into this for a new generation, a new audience is exciting to me. I could see this being a thing that someone who doesn't like Batman or didn't really like the original would still enjoy this just as a movie on its own. Yeah. I mean, you have to be open to animation. You have to be open to superheroes. If you like those things and you don't necessarily like Batman, this is just a good movie. 
stands by itself and then if anything just kind of leads to the the greater mystery if you've read the book first or if you watch the cartoon and then read the book you'd be like still you'd be surprised uh, either way yeah 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 just it doesn't cool. spoil the book really yeah yeah totally like okay well i see where some of that exists in this bigger thing and i can see how this other thing is just kind of larger and, and filled with more details and kind of convoluted if i missed anything i missed close-ups of alberto's unibrow <laughs> we got one at the very beginning Mm, but he didn't uh, have a unibrow, I don't think, but there was a very tight close up on his eyes. Yeah, but the, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, the I missed Calendar Man hiding in the walls. <laughs> That's in the next That's book. That's in Dark of. Victory. Uh, oh. But I had the same thought of like, yeah. Well, they didn't do it anyway. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, hiding in the walls at I, Arkham. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I guess uh, uh, other book, I, I, I also missed some some strong lady neck brace action. <laughs> <laughs> Another one that I'll add to the pros before we move on. I just want to shout out Chris Palmer, the director, because I thought the shot composition was really interesting. It has a very cinematic quality to it. Not only just in the action sequences and the way we talked about it conveys motion, but also just in the dialogue sequences, the way things are framed and the way the camera moves is very interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's part of what keeps it from being boring. Is you're always engaged by the visual, not yeah. just the quality of the art, but like the cinematography. Yeah. You talking uh, about Alberto just reminded me there was one other one. There's a tight close up on his eyes. There's also one brief shot of Gordon turning his head, and you get the full reflections in the glasses. Oh, mm -hmm. there was. Mm -hmm. It was just for a moment, and I was like, oh, "That's neat that they only did it then." Mini it didn't become a thing. That's great. Yeah, because I, I loved that in the original. Sometimes I think that, and I know that animated stuff isn't going to have the budget that a live action movie does, but I think that they'll kind of do themselves a disservice sometimes by not treating themselves like the animated version of the same medium. So you have stuff like that where you're talking about Sam, where you're like, oh, that was a dope, like, treat it like scenes in a movie. Because you can, making stuff seem more cinematic is obviously budgetary restrictions and and skill level and stuff but you could do that and you can make yourself look more legitimate and more like a real art form and not like a thing for kids if Cartoon you treat it and children yeah exactly like treat it like you're drawing scenes in a movie treat it like that give it awesome vocal performances and stuff and get it as close to resembling that as possible yeah. if you want to be taken a little more seriously cons what do we have for cons I kind of wove my joke cons into the pros. No unibrow close-up. No neck brace, no unibrow close-up. Uh, I had one. Kitty cat costume. It's not the one you like. No high uh, leg warmer socks. I just would have, well, I mean, and again, I don't <laughs> want that. I would have been fine with them, like, making a revision, but I thought it would be cool to have. Purple uh, a tail. Yeah, a purple costume and, like, a little more of an ear thing or a tail or something just a little more of a visual nod would have been cool to me i really do like the more modern character design on this one if it's I, I don't not like this one i like it a lot i just like a uh, little nods to source material yeah i think this does a good job of both fitting the tone of the original and fitting in with the existing animated universe totally my only real con, and it's this movie's Batman spins faster than the bullet flies. And thankfully, it came very early in the movie. It's so always it before I was even fully drawn in, so it didn't pull me out. It's when early on in the Batman and Catwoman chase, she's hanging from the gargoyle. Yeah. And he's like, let me help you up or whatever he says. And she's like, no, thanks. And she just lets go. Oh, and falls on the train. She falls multiple stories, many mm. stories. Yeah. And then lands flat footed on the train. Doesn't yeah. Even, like take a roll to throw the momentum or something. I forgot about I that. I dislike that, that as Is well. Is this movie's going to be? It's going to be all that kind of stuff. And thankfully, it wasn't. Yeah, she's but, dead. <laughs> yeah, she, she has broke no legs. Both her legs. And yeah, her yeah. Head. Her shins don't exist anymore. <laughs> and then she's the one in the wheelchair and the neck brace in, in the rest of the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler twist. My only other con that I didn't mention was the same issue I had with Harleen, and this is unnecessary censorship. Because in the Scarface shootout scene, Sophia grabs a gun and says, you mother, and starts shooting, right? Which is common for a cartoon, 
right? Yeah. But in the very next beat, Carmine has a gun to his head and says, pull the fucking trigger. Mm. And this movie, part two specifically, carries the R rating that part one doesn't have. And I just don't understand those things when someone is willing to go to this place and then unwilling to go to this place at the same time in the same scene, pretty much. Well, I was going to say maybe it was a rating thing, but you just told me it's R, so it's not that. Yeah. Yeah, they can have, have as many fucks as they want. Again, the other one's black label. This one's rated R. DC, why are you doing these things? The only other thing I can think is to give the, the second one more weight. Yeah, I guess. But it's just like write a different line then or uh, like I don't need these like home alone PG rated son of a you know like uh, I just don't I do if I hear two fucks in a movie I turn it off <laughs> you, you sound uh, like my aunt that's what she does observation not actually a con it doesn't take anything away from the whole to me but I felt as if the character drawings in the second one got a little less good and a little less solid than the first one. Mm. Maybe a budgetary thing? I figure if they already so. have you hooked. You're huh. gonna I didn't notice through. at all. I don't know if they were working on them simultaneously or maybe uh, another group of people did the second one could so be. that they could work on them simultaneously. So it was kind of like on model, but slightly not the same. It just looked a little less solid to me. You've got the eagle eye, but I watched them both twice this week and didn't notice, so I don't know. For sure. There's a video game thing where, like, some huge major percent of people never actually finish video games, so the back half is always worse because oh. they don't know if they're actually going to see it. <laughs> mm. Funny. Makes sense, though. The Batman trifecta detective. What do we have? She's not very good. People make fun of him for not being a good enough detective. Yeah, and there's a couple little things, too, where, like, in the very beginning... They show the crime scene photo from Johnny Vitti, the very first one. And he's like, where's the jack-o'-lantern? And they're like, I don't know. Do you think it's important? And then he never follows up on it. <laughs> he misses. Nope, now that you say that, it's not. <laughs> Good point. <laughs> yeah, too shit. He misses the whole Oxford thing. Like, I don't even know where he got that idea that Harvey went there because he was fucking wrong. He seems to just have this major blind spot for Harvey even while openly discussing him as a person of interest, just being like, you know, they're mobsters, right? They can keep dying. Like, I just want to exhaust all other possibilities and let this drag out a full fucking year before I go with my gut. I don't want to rush anything. I'm not very concerned about the body count. <laughs> the comic is so full of narrative. Yeah. This one doesn't have that, and that's fine that's not what i would usually put in stuff but that's one of the things that really makes these written stories seem extra like a detective story to me yeah is this constant observational narrative the inner stuff. monologue of yeah him, oh and i see the dust on the thing has moved over and moved. yeah because you can add all these little details that show that whoever is saying this stuff to me is really observant the serial numbers on these nails <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I look very close at all the details. Oxford? Huh. Ninja? It's pretty badass. Yeah. Less badass than future Batman might be. Yeah, he's, he's pretty, he's he's pretty awesome. a more grounded or newer. Yeah, more green. Yeah, he's not quite as adept on his feet, but we have the Chinatown scene. We have Falcone's office at the end. I mean, there's enough good stuff in here for sure. For a story yeah, he, that I wasn't really part of before. Yeah. Exactly. They pretty much added that stuff. Yeah, you're right. They gave us more than we signed up for. Mm -hmm. Trauma. There's no hulking scene of him ripping off the bars, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the hugest pecs ever. Trauma. What do we have for trauma? Like in the original, mainly the fear toxin scene. And even that's kind of yeah. checked down from what it was. I could see that. I, I was thinking more along the lines of the Thomas Carmine history sort of feeling like a stain on his family. Sure. That he has to fix. Exactly. Yeah. Like he's kind of, was that even mentioned in this or was that maybe it's something else that I just watched recently, but talking about like the sons having to right the wrongs of the fathers and all that, you know, that's what Alfred says to Gordon and Dan when they leave. Right. Our right. Sons will have to continue 
righting the wrongs of the fathers or something. Oh, yeah. yeah. He says, like, it's a shame that the sons have to inherit yeah. this. Will we ever live system. in a world where they don't? Or- yeah. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Okay. Final rating. Parts one and two. All together. Five. Wow. I had a great time with this. And maybe it helps that I was going in with a negative expectation or skeptical. But I no, this is this is exactly the tone of the Batman thing that I want. Yeah. Tone and content wise. That's great. Pleasant surprise. I think five is good as well. I can hardly think of anything that I don't really like about it. And it makes me pumped about what might come out after this. Well, that's great. I wrote five too. I was a little on the fence maybe about four and a half, but it's not phantasm, you know, but it's top five animated, I think. I would say, like, with Phantasm, Red Hood, Dark Knight Returns, this is definitely in that group. I mean, a huge improvement over some of the other things that we've been watching, too. Yeah. Yeah, even if those things had their strengths, just as overall packages, they were not at this level. Mm -hmm. Well, sweet. I'm glad that we all uh, enjoyed this one. This is Robin. Thanks for checking out the Bat Fanatic podcast with Sammy Warman. All right, that is our show. Thank you guys so much for listening. I do want to answer a question that Evan had raised towards the end of the show regarding differences between parts one and two. So evidently what happened was near the completion of part one, the Batman from Matt Reeves went into production and it is based on the same source material and therefore DC wanted to delay this project so they come out a little bit closer to one another. So part two was produced at a later date. Now, if you want to support the show, as mentioned, go to our Instagram at BatFanAddict and click the link in our bio for our Patreon, or just take a screenshot of this episode, post that to your stories. We are going to return to this universe once again with Jeff Loeb and Tim Sales' 2021 The Long Halloween Special.